Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Facial Pain Association's webinar series. Tonight, Dr. Jeffrey Brown, um, who is chair of the Medical Advisory Board, will be interviewing Dr. Winfrey. Um, Dr. Winfrey, just a little background, completed his training in neurosurgery, and he is currently a professor specializing in peripheral nerve and pain neurosurgery. Um, questions can be submitted throughout the webinar. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can at the end of the session, but if we do not get to them, please feel free to email them to us. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Brown. Good evening. So uh, my job as the interviewer is to uh, tweak Dr. Uh, Winfrey as much as possible to help give you the information you need to figure out what to do with this new, but maybe not so new drug. So I'm going to start with a couple of slides. I, uh, where did they go? They were all there. And then, there we go. No. Hold on. There we go. Let me just show you this to get started and see if that gets... Dr. Brown, really hold on. We easy. can't see your screen. Can't see my screen at all? Yeah, pull the slides up. Can you see it? No. Oh, dear. There we go. No. Nope. There we go. All right. Got it? Yep, that's great. So, cannabis and facial pain. This is what we thought of cannabis in 1950. Oh, Christ. Come on. Enough of that. So let me show you a case. A uh, person that I saw, a 60-year-old woman with two years of what's called boring pain, a kind of neuropathic pain below her left eye. She had sinus surgery. She didn't get better. She had gabapentin. She went through acupuncture and Botox and capsaicin and ketamine creams, and she had an MRI, which showed that there was a vein on top of her trigeminal nerve, and then she had a microvascular decompression. The vein was identified, it was coagulated and separated from the nerve, and she didn't get better. She wants to ask me, is marijuana something she should try? So the question to Dr. Winfrey is, how should I advise her? The answer is yes, yes, yes. First all of all, right. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown and the Facial Pain Association for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Hopefully it'll be helpful and informative to those of you who are interested in learning more about medical marijuana. One note about that video, and this is the first time I actually saw that video, what struck me is that the marijuana cigarettes were compared to otherwise harmless regular cigarettes. <laughs> Just to show how times have changed since the 1950s where now medical marijuana is the, uh, is the good, not harmless, but the good thing in the, Tobacco, the regular cigarettes are the bad thing. It's just 
goes to show you that what we think is think is so uh, certain can change in the future. And so that's kind of the story of, of, of marijuana. Things are changing. So tell me a little bit. What, tell me a little bit about what Dr. How, how marijuana came around to this country. So marijuana, both for recreational and medicinal purposes, has been around almost since the start of human civilization, going back thousands and thousands of years. And it was more prominent in Asian and specifically Indian medicine uh, in more recent centuries. And it was brought to America or the Americas by a uh, physician in the 1800s, I believe from India. And it it was used to treat a variety of uh, pain conditions, uh, most commonly headaches, as I recall. Uh, migraines were, were one of the ones that appeared in the literature as, as a good indication for medical marijuana. And it was actually uh, very popular amongst physicians, even William Osler, you know, a very famous physician in his, uh, in his treatise discussed the use of medical marijuana specifically to treat headache pain. And, uh, you know, it became a, a part of modern medicine at that time. Unfortunately, some events happened since then, which have sort of pushed it into the, into the, uh, into the underworld, so to speak, of, of modern medicine and, until recently. So is marijuana a drug that we can use? Because there are different classifications of drugs. Some are easily prescribed, some are more difficult to prescribe. There are. There's a, the, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency, or the U.S. government, has classified drugs into anywhere from Schedule One. Two, three, four, or five. With Schedule One being the most um, uh, difficult drugs to, to to utilize because they have the highest potential for abuse. Uh, Schedule One drugs are also thought to have no medical utility, and so they're the ones that are uh, typically not uh, a, a permitted uh, to be prescribed and to, and to be used. Marijuana, unfortunately, is a Schedule One. Other types of medications like narcotics, depending on the, the strength of the narcotic, can be Schedule 2, Schedule 3, even further down, Schedule 4 and 5, just some of the narcotics that have no or very little abuse potential, like the ones you would take to treat, for example, diarrhea, you know, things like that. Um, so there, it's a whole scheduling system. The, 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 the lower the number, the, uh, the harder it is to, to get a prescription for and, and to use, with the Schedule 1s being drugs that are thought to not be useful. So take me into the, the heart of the different kinds of marijuana substances that you can use and how they differ, the, the complexity. Well, of there, are, there are a vast array of, of marijuana uh, substances, um, everything from plants that are grown, so the natural cannabis, the cannabis plant, uh, which has been around for as long as we've known about marijuana. That's how it was originally uh, utilized. There are different strains. Some have higher THC ratios versus CBD. Some are just different. Some are almost all CBD, which, with, which has no psychoactive component, psychoactive component. And those are classically the hemp plants, the ones that are used for fabrics and textiles. And CBD is now being used to treat pain. Um, so different types of marijuana plants, some that are um, more difficult to, to deal with because they're not legal in certain states, and some are. And some are. Now, um, that's the marijuana plants. There are synthetic formulations of medical marijuana as well, which are designed by drug companies and produced in laboratories. They can either be plant-derived substances that are extracted from plants, so natural products that are then put into drug form. Others are synthetically derived mimics of typically the THC molecule. That's the active ingredient, the psychoactive ingredient in medical marijuana. And there are some that are THC with CBD, which, again, are either plant-derived or, or synthetic. So CBD uh, stands for cannabinol? Cannabidiol. Uh, cannabidiol is, the, uh, is the, one of the, the two main ingredients. There are a lot of ingredients in medical marijuana, but the two major ones that most people talk about are THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's the ingredient that produces the high of marijuana, the, the psychoactive effects. CBD is the one that tends to produce the anti, I believe, the anti-emetic effects and the anti, some of the anti-seizure effects and the anti-pain effects, anti-inflammatory effects of, of medical marijuana. But it's not psychoactive. So you would not get a high from taking a, a CBD-type uh, drug. Um, what's also interesting about marijuana is a lot of people are reluctant to, to roll a, a joint and smoke it. It can be irritating. Some people are concerned about the 
the, the lung issues, cancer, breathing in, you know, smoke, uh, which I can understand. So a lot of ways of delivering the drug have been developed and vaporizing or, you know, vaping is a very popular one where it basically it, it, it vaporizes the, the drug at a temperature below which the, the substance would burn. So you're not producing smoke, but you are producing the gaseous form of the drug to be inhaled. So you don't inhale a bunch of tar and ash and carcinogens that you would otherwise get from smoking a joint. And a lot of people will find that's a lot less irritating, a lot easier to do, and it's a very potent way of ingesting the, uh, the substance. Medical marijuana can also be infused into foods. You can get granola bars, gummy bears. Uh, there's weed-infused espresso for those times where you want to, you know, take the medication but stay awake and get some things done because marijuana can make some people sleepy. Um, again, a lot of different formulations that can make the ingesting the medication not so onerous for people that are bothered by inhaling something smoky. I mean, picture somebody with COPD who's been off cigarettes for a number of years trying to recover, inhaling a bunch of smoke. It would it'd probably not be a good thing for someone with reactive airway disease and a variety of other you know, maladies. So they can just eat a gummy bear and get the same medicinal effects. So how do people feel when they're taking this cannabinoid? What does it do to them? Do they well, um, pain and they stay awake? Do they get drowsy? What do they feel like? So this is based on conversations I have regularly with my patients. And just for the record, I don't prescribe medical marijuana, but I recommend that my patients who are considering any form of neuromodulation, stimulators, pain pumps, to consider medical marijuana before doing the neuromodul neuromodulation procedure. I don't make them try it, but I bring it up and I invite them to try it because I think it's, it's worth doing. And I ask them afterwards what it was like and what their experience is. And, and most say that, it was similar to the high they got maybe in high school or college when they tried it. Um, some say that the, the drugs have gotten a lot stronger, and, and there's data to support that. We can talk about how these, these pot plants have gotten stronger over the years. Um, some say that they, they tolerate the side effects, but it makes them a little foggy. Some say it makes them a little hungry. Some say it makes them sleepy. A lot of patients only take it at night, right? They, uh, they find that they can't smoke up or ingest the medication in the beginning of the day and then go to work all day or try to go to school all day, they'll fall asleep. And so a lot just take it at night before bed. It helps alleviate the pain. It relaxes them and it helps them sleep throughout the night or for a certain portion of the night. But they, they tend not to, 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 to utilize the medication during the day because of side effects. And some people say the side effects are totally manageable, which is kind of the same conversation I have with people on chronic narcotics. A lot of people on chronic opioids can function just fine, even on high dose narcotics. And others are real sensitive to it. They, they can only take them at night when they're not trying to work or drive or sleep um, or interact with their kids or families or, or whatever. I mean, it, everyone's got a different reaction to it. And I hear the full spectrum of reactions to this drug, like almost any other drug, right? Well, this movie says it makes you crazy. Does it make anybody crazy? Do they have crazy thoughts? Crazy. So, I mean, probably a very small percentage of people have bad reactions to this. I mean, some people can become paranoid. Again, anybody who's smoked up in high school or college understands what, what that means. You smoke up and otherwise you're not a paranoid person and you can feel paranoid for a period of time. But I don't know that it can really make people psychotic, at least not in any sort of common, common way. The clinical trials that have been done have looked at the safety of, of marijuana and the adverse events that were reported were the ones we've discussed and the ones a lot of you have experienced already if you've, if you've tried weed in, in high school or college or any other stage of life where you get a little hungry, get a little sleepy, makes some people happy, um, it, it makes some people inquisitive, uh, but outright psychosis I don't believe has been reported, at least not, that I've seen in clinical trials. Um, and as far as I know, uh, there's been no documented deaths from marijuana overdose ever in the history of medicine. So it's, it's, it's actually pretty safe. I mean, yes, there are some side effects, but overall it can be a safe and effective drug if managed appropriately. Um, and there's data to suggest that incorporating medical marijuana into a population can be protective against other sort of problems like traffic fatalities and opioid overuse deaths. And we can get into some of that data if you'd like. But, uh, but no, I, I, I disagree with the premise of that video that, that marijuana, when smoked, makes people 
you know, crazy. In fact, it, it tends to have a sort of a calming, uh, almost more zen-like effect in most people. In fact, it puts a lot of people to sleep. It doesn't make them go out and do violent things. That's more typical for alcohol or um, angel dust, you know, some PCP, some of these other drugs, which clearly cause those or elicit those reactions in people. Medical marijuana, not so much. So the concern that's raised is that it's a, quote, gateway, unquote. Is it a gateway to something more dangerous? So if the premise is that the adoption of medical marijuana legalization or even a recreational marijuana legalization will then result in a population turning to more aggressive medications. If that, let's just stipulate that that is the case. It's not, but just for the sake of argument, let's say that that's true. One would expect to see an increase in opioid overdose deaths in that state in the years following medical marijuana law passage, right? I mean, we're saying it's a gateway drug. Let's say those gateway drugs would be things like heroin, fentanyl, street drugs that are potentially lethal. And if a population is going to use more of those drugs, by consequence, there's going to be more overdose deaths. That's just reality. So this has been looked at. And if you look at the CDC data, so the, 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 the data that the Centers for Disease Control has, if you look at all the deaths, like the, the, the death certificate records, this has been looked at in all 50 states. And this has been looked at over a period of time spanning 1999 to 2014, I believe, was the, the time period. Medical marijuana legalization. So when states passed that, it actually had a protective effect against opioid overdose deaths. All right. Now, not saying it's causative, but the fact that opioid overdose deaths dropped after the passage of medical marijuana law suggests that it's not a gateway drug because the exact opposite thing happened. What also they noted is that the effect became stronger the longer those laws were in effect. So the longer a state's population had to utilize marijuana as a drug, the fewer and fewer people were dying of opioid overdose deaths, which is remarkable because mm -hmm. opioid overdose deaths have been increasing on average in this nation. In fact, they surpassed, I think, the deaths by car accidents this past year, or at least recently. So in a country where opioid overdose deaths are increasing, states that have passed medical marijuana laws are seeing a decrease compared to states that don't have medical marijuana laws. And that's pretty remarkable. And that's compelling evidence. It's not proof, but it's compelling evidence that medical marijuana does not, in fact, lead people to try gateway or serve as a gateway to other stronger drugs like heroin, fentanyl, that would then lead to their deaths. So I would argue, argue the exact opposite. But is it in and of itself addictive? So every drug can potentially be addictive, just about any psychoactive drug. So there's ways of measuring the addictive potential of drugs. And of the drugs that have been studied, everything from heroin, to fentanyl, to tobacco, to alcohol, marijuana has the lowest addictive potential, the lowest, with alcohol being one of the highest, and that's legal. Tobacco is also one of the highest, and that's legal. Marijuana, the lowest of all the drugs studied, the lowest, and it's not legal. So that's not a rationale for keeping medical marijuana not legal. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the least addictive of all of the psychoactive drugs that are either legal or available commonly, like heroin and opioids and all the rest. So we went through pretty quickly at the beginning the difference between THC and the cannabinols, but is there any way you can guide someone who's getting started with using this for their facial pain on how to get going? How do they go through this process? Well, there's two ways to approach this. One is um, trial and error, like any medication. Your doctor says, look, here are the types of medications we can try for your facial pain. And you try them. And there's no particular reason to choose one versus the other. Uh, maybe cost, maybe one's been shown to be more effective. But all these are roughly equivalent in, in terms of effectiveness. The other thing is, um, currently there's only a, two medications, I believe, two formulations of synthetic opioids that are available and neither one has a high CBD 
content. So remember, CBD is the cannabidiol. Cannabidiol, that's the one that is effective for pain, more effective for pain. THC is the psychoactive active component that's not so effective for pain. It can be, but CBD is what you really want to be taking if you have the option. And currently, there are no CBD formulations that are FDA approved for pain. There is one or two that are people can get sort of these compassionate exemptions on a case by case basis. But currently, the market doesn't have uh, a number of CBD options available for you and your doctor to pick. So it's good to know about these. And when the time comes where the markets open up and pharma has produced a number of either synthetic or natural cannabinoids that have high CBD content, specifically targeting pain syndromes, currently you may just have access to a medical marijuana prescription in your state, in which case you may not have a lot of choice in terms of what um, exactly what type of strain of medication you're going to get, right? So I think right now, knowing that a high CBD to THC content is desirable, and if you have a formulary that has a number of different uh, plants, for example, or formulations, and you can ask the dispensary which one is better for pain, they'll have some idea. But the, the, the market's just not sufficiently open for us to have a number of synthetically derived options that we can choose from, one for pain, one for nausea, one for, you know, wasting, you know, the, the weight loss and, and so forth. So it just, it's, we're just not there yet within a few years, but having some working knowledge of that as a patient would be good moving forward. It's just not going to help you too much now. So when this dispensary says that this is the ratio, is there a way that that's checked or do you have to trust what they say? Is there any governing organization that looks into it? Well, so you're asking about quality control in a dispensary and that oh. I'm not Certain. I mean, it's possible states regulate that, but I, my understanding is that there's no federal regulation of that. Um, I mean, these are all cash-based businesses. They're trying to stay out of the federal oversight and, and reach the federal government. So what, any regulation there is is not likely to be from the federal government. But each state may have its own requirements for quality control. And But I don't know that, that that's checked. I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, it may be up to the dispensary. But understand that this is a fairly competitive market in the states where it's legal. And if a dispensary is is falsely advertising, you know, bad products, I don't, you know, it's probably not going to happen, right? Or at least those will probably be, you know, um, eliminated fairly quickly. Uh, so I, I probably wouldn't worry too much about that. Given all the things in this world to worry about, that's probably not what I would worry about. What I would worry about is getting bad bad weed on the streets in states that where it's not legal, right? So there was there are a number of um, cases actually in the press right now of people having bad reactions to 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 marijuana, these nausea syndrome, some other you know bad things are happening with people getting illicit drugs, you know, trying to either self medicate or recreational use, not going through a, a state licensed dispensary. I think the risks are much greater there than through a formal dispensary. Probably you think because the marijuana is mixed with other entities that you don't want to be getting involved with? Well, I mean, if you're buying a black market product, right, not from a dispensary in a state where it's legalized, but a black market product off the street, I mean, that is the classic buyer beware. You don't know what's in that, and I would never advocate that somebody does that. I don't tell my patients to do that. Um, it, it's just because you don't know what's gonna what's in it. There's zero regulation on the street, right? Um, let's switch directions. We, you talked briefly about the science behind this. Do you want to spend a little time talking about what science has been done to help us know its efficacy and his risks? So the, the best science to look at are a handful of, of clinical trials, drug trials, basically, looking at the effectiveness of medical marijuana in a variety of different formulations for a variety of different conditions. And sort of relevant to this discussion, uh, it's been it's been looked at a number of clinical trials uh, of both nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. So nociceptive pain is musculoskeletal pain, pain from arthritis, inflammation, incisional pain after surgery, uh, musculoskeletal type pain. Neuropathic pain is pain of neurogenic origin, so pain that originates within the nervous system. It feels different. Neurogen neuropathic pain typically has burning, numbing electrical shock-like quality, tingling quality, different than nociceptive pain. And people who have had neuropathic pain kind of know exactly what it is right off the bat. Patients are 
are very rarely confused about what neuropathic pain is. They know it when they feel it. It's very straightforward. Clinical trials have shown that medical marijuana can be effective for both of these types of pain. Now, this isn't magic. I mean, this is a medical marijuana is a medication like many others. Uh, it works through a different mechanism, but it's not a panacea. So take medical marijuana, for example, uh, there's a, what's called a meta-analysis where they combine the clinical trial data from five or 10 different clinical studies. And they combined all that patient data and analyzed it. And it turns out that the effectiveness of medical marijuana for neuropathic pain was comparable to the effectiveness of a anticonvulsant, specifically gabapentin for neuropathic pain. And the way they classify this, the way they quantify this is NNT, numbers needed to treat. How many patients do you need to treat before you get a successful response. So success usually being defined as relief of 50% of the pain. So the NNT for medical marijuana is a little over five, five and a half. That's basically the same, very similar to Neurontin, which is also about five and a half or so. So medical marijuana has results in clinical trial data that are similar to the anticonvulsants, which are considered first line treatments for most neuropathic pain states, facial pain, headaches, um, nerve pain syndromes, et cetera. So again, the, the clinical trial data is there. What I would say about the clinical trial data and the subsequent meta-analyses where they're pooling this data and looking at it, the numbers for these drug trials number in the hundreds of patients. So most blood pressure medications, just to use an example, or statin medications that are looked at um, to bring a drug to market often involve tens of thousands of patients. So the numbers aren't there yet. The data's there, and the data's promising, but it's still early on. And since medical marijuana research is difficult because it doesn't really get federal funding, it's not legal everywhere, it's a Schedule One drug, it's understandable why the numbers of these drug trials are low. But what drug trials there are, albeit with limited numbers of patients, the results are promising. But it's still early. Thousands and thousands of more patients need to be enrolled in these trials to really get a better grasp of how effective these medications are for particular pain syndromes. And also, more importantly, as the markets open up and more of these medications are developed and brought to market, they need to be looked at as well because they're all different and they all have different clinical trial effects with the high CBD drugs maybe being more effective for pain and then the high THC drugs being more effective for some of the you know, wasting disorders and and, not, and, you know, the nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy and, and so forth. So that still needs to be worked out a little bit. Um, so that's kind of where the clinical trial data is now, promising data with low numbers of patients. Are there big studies in the works that you know of? Is it moving quickly? Well, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there's about 100 uh, studies, at least 100 studies, looking at uh, – medical marijuana, some variant of medical marijuana for some variant of pain. So the studies are being done, but without having access to the clinical trials and looking at the data, I have no way of knowing how many patients are in clinical trials now. Um, but this field is growing and more and more states are legalizing it. These trials will get done over time. Um, if for no other reason, then I, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, in all fairness, will likely see this as a gold mine. And once you have commercial interests aligned with patient interests, you'll see an explosion of clinical trials, an explosion of availability of different medications, and a, a sort of unleashing of basically capitalism to help provide these medications to help patients get better. Now, I know that pharma and patients' interests don't always align perfectly, and I know there's, there can always be conflict. Not saying any of that won't ever happen. But what I'm saying is once you bring a, a, a commercially viable uh, product to, to, to clinical trials, and then you make it available, that opens up a lot of doors for patients. And it opens up a lot of money for research that's currently not available. And I think once medical marijuana is removed as a Schedule One drug and reclassified as a Schedule Two, you'll see an explosion of commercial interest in this and a, just an amplification of the number of clinical trials and the drugs available for patients to try. And I think that'll overall be a good thing for patients in pain. Most everyone's heard about Colorado where you can get this. What are the main states that you know of where this is legal 
to go and get. So New York and New Jersey. I live in New York. Um, New Jersey being most recent. Uh, kind of funny. Uh, uh, Chris Christie was left office as governor, and he was Republican. And now we have a new governor. Well, new Jersey has a new governor, who's Democratic, and one of his main priorities is to legalize marijuana. And that's you know half of my patients are from New Jersey, and so it overnight opened up a whole. Uh, new world of treatment for for my chronic pain patients in New Jersey. And that was that was a really good thing. Obviously, Oregon, Washington, California, a lot of the coastal states uh, have legalized uh, medical marijuana. A handful of states have legalized recreational marijuana. That's sort of a different topic than we're going through here. Um, probably too big to cover, uh, but there are definitely some big states that are that have approved uh, of medical marijuana. And so, a lot of patients have access to it. It's something like twenty eight states. And the District of Columbia are all uh, medical marijuana uh, permissive, and so I think more than half the U.S. population has access to the uh, to these medications now. If you're really conservative about what drugs you take, are there FDA-approved formulas of synthetic cannabis? There are. Yeah, there are two medications that are currently FDA-approved. They're FDA-approved to treat uh, the nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. And the um, wasting or the the loss of weight associated with HIV disease, and so both of these medications are available. Your physician can prescribe them. They are often prescribed off label for pain syndromes, uh, but they are available and people do use them. And medications, uh, Marinol and Sesamet, those are the two medications. There are a couple other medications that are in clinical trial, hoping to get FDA approval. Sativex is one of them. Um, that's actually a, 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 a plant derived combination of THC and CBD in a one to one ratio. So what that means is the, if you take Sativex, the amount of CBD, which as you recall is the pain relieving component of medical marijuana, the CBD ratio is much higher. When you get marijuana as a plant, normally it's anywhere from 14 to 80 THC to one CBD. So the CBD is way low. The THC is way high. Because if you think about it, most people that get marijuana, not for medicinal purposes, want the high, right? The psychoactive effect. And that comes from THC. So most marijuana plants will have high THC. What Sativex does is it dramatically raises the CBD. It makes it equivalent to the THC. So in theory, it should have augmented or increased pain relieving properties. And it's in clinical trials now the company hoping to secure FDA approval in the near future for pain. Not done yet. To clarify, those versions that are FDA approved are not for pain control primarily. Correct. They are they can be they have been used for pain, but as you can imagine, with the higher THC ratios, they're not as thought to be as effective for pain. Doesn't mean they're not effective, but that's sort of not what they're designed for, and that's not what they're FDA approved for. Doesn't mean patients don't have access to it or shouldn't try them. It's just that they were designed to treat things other than pain. And the high THC to cannabinol ratio, that's a breeding design of those that grow the drug? The plant well, so these are, these are synthetic drugs. So they are made in a lab, right? But the um, plants, though, like any selective breeding of any plant, whether it's to produce a bigger redder tomato or a better mango that transports a longer distance without perishing, without uh, rotting. Uh, you can make marijuana however you want. There, the, marijuana has been bred to have no THC. It produces hemp, so it's legal, and you can produce fabric from it. Others have high THCs. And if you look at um, what the, the DEA has actually done is they've actually analyzed confiscated illicit marijuana over the years. And the, the THC ratio has gone up. It's almost, I think, tripled in the past 20 years, roughly, which means, you know, the THC content has gone from some 4% or whatever to 12%, just to pick some ballpark numbers. Bottom line is through selective breeding, marijuana that's used illicitly has been bred to become more potent and more psychoactive. So if you talk to people who say, smoked marijuana in the 1960s or 70s, and they have some sense of what it's like to smoke a joint, and you have them smoke medical marijuana now, they will almost invariably tell you that that is not the same stuff they had in the 60s and 70s. It is a whole different animal. The drug has been bred, the plant has been bred to have 
more psychoactive effects because that's what the market wants. That's what people generally want on the street. Now, you can do the same thing with CBD or any of the other uh, substances to get whatever desired effects you want. And people are doing that. It's just like farmers do with any other uh, commodity. They, they breed it and grow it to, to match whatever market forces are dictating. And I think now you're going to see increased CBD ratios to help treat pain. Because the, so the consumers want it. These are oils. So is it possible to take these other than orally? Do you rub them on? Can you put them on your tongue? Uh, so there are a variety of different formulations, nasal sprays or oral and nasal sprays. You can smoke it, vape it. You can add it to other foods. Um, there are a variety of different ways to, to ingest it. Uh, I don't know if there's topical agents, but there's uh, the Sativex comes as a mouth spray. And I think the others are um, are actually tablets that the two FDA approved drugs, I believe, are tablets. I've, I've not actually pres prescribed or used them myself, but, um, I, you know, they can they can. Again, this is again, this is what I was talking about, the whole market forces. When you open up, you, you make medical marijuana schedule two, you're going to see a thousand different formulations in almost every imaginable form. Pill, shot, candy. I mean, it's, it's limitless. Right now, it's not, so the market forces aren't there to push it, so there's very few formulations, very few ways to, to ingest the drug, but there might be half a dozen different ways that you have access to as a patient. So you talked about the movement to make it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. How can people get involved if they're interested in making that happen? Well, I think being um, vocal with your uh, your your state representatives probably, you know, talk to your senators, your representatives, um, not the state legislatures, but, the, but the, the Congress people would probably be the best. Just let them know that, look, you're a patient who needs access to these medications. And the more they hear about their constituents, the more likely they would be to vote yes. You know, this is a public health issue. And I think letting your, 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 your elected representatives know is probably a good way to do it. Now, I understand there have been some very powerful players who've been advocating changing the Schedule One thing. The, the American Medical Association has has appealed uh, several times, both during the initial classification and ever since. There have been two formal reviews by the Federal Drug Administration, one in 2001 and I believe 2006, where they looked at their scheduling and they kept it Schedule One. So it's not like people aren't looking at this. There's been interest. The government revisit this revisits this periodically. Um, it just hasn't been reclassified yet. But I think that the more people at a grassroots level talk to their rep elected representatives, the more likely this is to happen. And I think it's going to happen at some point. It's just obviously the more people who can have their voices heard, the better. So are there out-of-the-box uses of medical marijuana that are being thought about that we haven't talked about? Well, are epilepsy. Right. Uh, that's that's been popular in the in the press. So there was a situation where um, there was one type of medical marijuana. And I don't remember the name, but it had sort of a kind of a catchy name that treated a particular type of childhood epilepsy. And it was the only place in the country, Colorado, where you could get this legally. And so families were in a situation. They're actually moving to Colorado with their child that had this epilepsy form just so they could get this medication. I mean, uprooting their families, leaving their jobs moving to Colorado just for this. It was completely insane. But that sort of brought to the public awareness that, look, this drug can be useful for a lot of different things that we've never heard of before. So epilepsy, pain syndromes, nausea and vomiting, wasting disorders. I mean, a lot of things that affect a lot of people. And, and, and this type of medication can provide some relief to these people that otherwise have no good treatments. What about kids? Is it okay for kids? Questions coming up about that. So the answer is is maybe. Um, I don't know that sufficient studies have been done in children. Um, we do know from some of the epilepsy patients, the one I just mentioned in Colorado, that that form of medical marijuana was used specifically in children with this devastating form of epilepsy. So we know it's used in children. Fortunately, children don't make up a high percentage of chronic pain patients. Not that they're not ever in chronic pain, but it's just there's fewer of them. And as a result, there's going to be a, a, a lack of clinical trial data. So I don't want to overreach. What I will say is what children I've seen treated in the medical literature, it seems to be reasonable. But like any other medication, 
you know, there are issues, right? If you treat a child with chronic narcotics, that can have issues with cognitive development, um, hormone levels, and it's probably also true, maybe to different degrees, with medical marijuana. You know, the anticonvulsants and antidepressants, which can be great medications, there can be issues with these in, in adolescents, for example, the suicidality with some of the anticonvulsants. So a lot of these drugs can get complicated in pediatric and adolescent populations. So I don't want to overgeneralize and say that just because something is shown to be pretty safe in adults means necessarily it's safe in children. I think it needs to be studied more. But I don't want to just shut the door on and say, nope, can't ever give a, a, a child this because I don't know that that's appropriate either. I think the best thing to do is to speak with your prescriber and see what the laws are in whatever state which you live and see what the appropriateness is for, for the child who potentially needs the medication. And, it, it, and the risks of medical marijuana need to be balanced against the risks of whatever cocktail of medications they may already be on, right? Or balanced mm-hmm. against suffering if not on any medications. I mean, all of those things can have dire consequences. And so, Let me go back to the side effects to emphasize them. Is there an effect on short-term memory? Does it make you forgetful? Tends to. That's one of the things that came out in the clinical trials. And anybody that smoked it probably give you the same response. I mean, if you get high and watch a movie, try to remember all the details of that movie. It may not be so easy. So, yeah, that's one of the most common. And can it affect common. your judgment? Yeah. Does it cause a deterioration in your judgment? Now, it's not necessarily going to make you, you know, kill your spouse, quit your job, and do, you know, psychotic things. But can you make bad decisions? On any mind-altering substance, it's it's not an unreasonable thing to have happen. So again, you got to be careful with this stuff. These are not drugs devoid of side effects. I'll leave it open to you for anything you think we left out before we take on some questions from the world around us. I think it would be good for people to understand that medical marijuana has promise. It's been around a long time. It's got some demonstrated safety. It's got some demonstrated effects on syndromes that are going to affect people in this webinar, pain specifically. The clinical trial data is promising, but it's limited. We need to have thousands upon thousands of more patients trying these medications in controlled clinical trials to really establish the benefits and to really clarify some of the side effects and whether the risk of the medications outweigh the benefits. We think they do based on the initial trial data, but we have to be mindful that additional studies have to be done. We also have to be hopeful that the drug it's changed from Schedule 1 to a Schedule 2, both to make it easier for patients to have access to it, but to also open up just the vast capital markets that will enable the development of these drugs. And it's also to keep in mind what new drugs are getting approved by the FDA and thus allowing patients to try them for things like pain. Because right now there's not a good FDA-approved specific, a pain-specific uh, cannabinoid, right? So keep an eye on that. It hopefully will happen in the near future. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of have a, have some knowledge of, of, of some of the potentially protective effects of these medications. You know, if somebody tells you that marijuana is a gateway drug, be able to say, well, no, in fact, it's not. And there's data to show that it's not likely to be a, a gateway drug. And if somebody says, look, medical marijuana or marijuana of any kind is going to make you go out and crash your car and, you know, hurt people. There's data to show that the exact opposite tends to happen. Right. So, so have some awareness of, of, of the, the benefits and also the limitations of these medications. And don't just, because somebody tells you that it's bad or shouldn't do it, that, it, that you necessarily believe them. I, I tend to be more of a believer in the evidence and, and go where the evidence leads. And right now the evidence looks pretty good for, for medical marijuana and all of its variants. Excellent summary. Allie, can you bring on some questions that people might have? Yeah, so the first question, um, Dr. Winfrey, if um, it is legal. Medical marijuana is legal in someone's state. Do all physicians prescribe medical marijuana or is it only specific physicians? How do, how do you go about asking for that as a treatment? So all physicians who have a medical li- license can, in theory, prescribe medical marijuana, but most don't. Um, most will want to have it part of their scope and practice. In other words, there will probably be a select few doctors, usually pain doctors. Uh, there may be some palliative care physicians, those who treat the terminal cancer who can prescribe it, a handful of other doctors, maybe some neurologists. But basically, pain physicians will likely be the ones that are prescribing most of the medical marijuana. 
So you may not be able to just go to your primary care doctor or cardiologist and, and ask for a medical marijuana prescription. You'll likely need to see a dedicated pain specialist. And I think that's, a, that's probably a good thing. Just like most physicians that prescribe chronic high-dose narcotics are probably going to be pain physicians as well. And I think those are the ones best equipped to manage some of these medications. And I think medical marijuana, at least for the time being, falls into that category. Again, I'm not saying that primary care doctors should never prescribe this. But what I'm saying is the likelihood of you being able to go to your primary care doctor and get a prescription is probably low. But if you went to a dedicated pain physician who does this and they're in a state where it's legal, you have a much more uh, much more likely to get a prescription from them. Um, so you need a, a specialized you know, some states are different. You need well, there's some places where there's a, like doc in the boxes in certain states where you just go and you say my elbow hurts and you, you get your marijuana card. I mean, that happens too, but that's probably not going to be the norm. I mean, it, it really should be done in the context of, a, of an actual physician patient relationship who knows you, they understand your pain problem, and they're able to integrate medical marijuana in with the rest of your treatment, whether it's neuromodulation or other medications, psychological support, rather than just going to somebody who just, you know, signs their name on a prescription. I think, you know, doing this properly is probably the best way to go. And I think a, a pain physician or a, dead, a physician who is dedicated a substantial part of the practice to understanding these issues, especially from a pain perspective, would be the most appropriate person to get a medical marijuana prescription from. Allie? So would you take medical marijuana consistently or would you just take it when you're having pain? Like, would you take it as a, a medication that you would be prescribed typically or do you just take it when you have the pain? What kind well, of schedule? Depends. Well, it totally depends. I mean, everyone's pain is different. Everyone's pain is unique to their experience. Some people have pain only at night when they're trying to sleep. They're basically okay during the day when the distractions of the day allow them to carry out their lives. When they lie in bed trying to sleep, the pain becomes horrible and they can't sleep. That person may choose to have their medical marijuana dose at night right before bed as part of their nightly routine. Glass of wine for most of us. Some people do their medical marijuana and they sleep like a baby for the rest of the night. They wake up, live their day off the drug, and they dose it like that. Other people may do the exact opposite. There are plenty of people commonly with low back pain that are fine when they're in bed and asleep. And as soon as they get out of bed, bang, the pain hits them like a ton of bricks, right? In that case, they may choose to not dose at night, but to dose during the day. Other patients, facial pain patients, where they have good days, or good weeks, bad days, bad weeks, patients with cluster headaches, and they go months without a headache, and they get a cluster of devastating headaches several a day for a week or two. Those patients may intermittently dose only when they're having flare-ups, right? So what's nice about this medication, unlike a lot of the anticonvulsants, antidepressants, which need to be dosed for lengthy periods of time to get a therapeutic effect, you can take medical marijuana when you need it and stay off of it when you don't. There's no um, buildup of, you know, you know, getting up your blood levels and all that that you have to do with some of these other medications. So it's a very versatile and a very flexible uh, type uh, medication. And I think it's great for, for patients who have flexible pain relieving needs. You know, those that don't need medication all the time, this would be a, I don't want to say perfect, but it'd be an ideal type medication for them. Ellie? Um, is there, can you take, med med use medical marijuana with other medications or can you, would medical marijuana be an, your only option? Like, can you work medical marijuana into a cocktail of other medications? Yes. In fact, most people with difficult to treat neuropathic pain are already doing something called multimodal therapy. And this has been sort of where pharmacologic pain management's gone in the past five or 10 years. Historically, physicians will try to treat a symptom like pain with a single drug, escalate that drug up till it's either effective or has side effects. And if it doesn't work, you switch to a different drug, a series of monotherapy, so a single drug therapy. What the anesthesiologists have, have known and written guidelines about is that when you're treating a complex pain syndrome, multimodal therapy, in which you use multiple different medications in different medication classes, each of which works through its own unique mechanism, can be utilized simultaneously, ideally at lower doses, so that patients get pain relief with fewer side effects. Instead of taking a single medication up to a high dose, getting a lot of side effects, you start at a low dose, 
keep it up to a modest dose. And if it doesn't have sufficient therapeutic benefit, add a second medication at a low dose, no side effects. And then a third medication, low dose, little to no side effects. And by doing this multimodal therapy with several medications working with different mechanisms, you can get a desired level of pain relief with few or little side effects. Incorporating medical marijuana into this scheme of multimodal therapy is probably the best way to do it. Now, there will certainly be patients in whom medical marijuana has dramatic pain relieving effects, and they won't need the anticonvulsants or the narcotics or the baclofen or whatever. They can just utilize the medical marijuana. And that's great. But that's on a case by case basis. But the, 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 the goal should be to utilize multiple medications at low doses, including medical marijuana, keeping the side effect profile down, but the therapeutic response nice and high, getting a nice, you know, high level of pain relief. So I mean, it depends yes. on the patient, like anything. Can you have an allergic reaction to marijuana, cannabinols, like other drugs? So it's interesting. I, I would have until recently said no, but there's been reports actually in the, in the lay press very recently talking about this. Uh, I forgot what the name is, but it's this, this cannabinoid uh, disorder where patients who are daily smokers or daily intakers of medical marijuana, small percentage, get in a situation where you get this horrible nausea and vomiting, just devastating you know, episodes. It can be days long. And the only thing that relieves it are hot showers. And you can read about this. There's an article in, I don't know, CNN or New York Times uh, recently about it, and um, where these people had no idea what was happening. They were going to hospitals. Doctors couldn't diagnose them. But now it's a well-recognized side effect, possibly an allergy. It's almost, it almost sounds like a, like a gluten allergy where you get these weird GI, uh, you know, gastro, gastrointestinal side effects from, from these medications. But it's not gluten. It's from, from medical marijuana. And it's with, with chronic sort of daily use of it. And it happens in a small percentage of patients. And again, I don't know if it's been worked out. I don't know if it's an allergy or if it's some sort of just other toxic effect. But yeah, there, there are definitely these weird idiosyncratic negative reactions to the medication. Uh, but it's rare to, to see that in somebody who doesn't take it chronically. Is, is there any absolute contraindication to taking it that someone should know about? Absolute contraindication. Um, meaning there's just absolutely no way one should take it. I right. can't think of one unless you have no, some horrible think you could. I just want to clarify that probably is. I'm not, I'm not aware of one, but I, I guess if you had a really bad allergy, one of the medications and you had an aphylaxis where you had hives and you had difficulty breathing. I mean, that would be a reason not to, yeah. if you could consistently say that it was from actually the, 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 the ingredients in the marijuana, that's probably a reason to stay away from it. Like any other medication, that's about the only absolute contraindication I can think of. Allie? Is there an age or duration as to when medical marijuana might be most effective? So should you start medical marijuana sooner rather than later? So not re with regards to the medical marijuana. I mean, we talked about the, the use in children and adolescents, and that's still being worked out. But I will say for neuropathic pain, which is something that's near and dear to the probably most of the people listening on this webinar, the longer a person has untreated or undertreated neuropathic pain, the harder that pain syndrome is to treat long term, the less likely you are to maintain control of that over the long term. So if you have neuropathic pain for a number of weeks or even a few months, it's a high probability you're going to be able to get that pain under control with some type of treatment, pharmacologic, neuromodulatory, or otherwise. If you have chronic undertreated or untreated neuropathic pain for years and years and years, that's a much more difficult pain to treat. So with that sort of physiology in mind, my advice is any neuropathic pain syndrome you have, try to get it treated as soon as you can. It's not one of those things where your doctor should say, well, you should have pain for a year or two before trying medical marijuana. That just makes no sense. You should aggressively treat neuropathic pain as soon as you can, as soon as it's diagnosed and as soon as you can get on a treatment algorithm. Don't wait. Um, but that's not just specific to medical marijuana. That's just a general principle of the treatment of neuropathic pain. Dr. Janetta, in his lifetime review of patients with trigeminal neuralgia, discovered that patients who had pain for more than eight years did less well than those who had pain for fewer. That's a large number, but it's clearly showing what you said. There is a time constraint to get going in the treatment. Other questions, Allie? Uh, yes. So for someone who's younger, someone had a question about pregnancy. Can it be used during pregnancy? 
I would think, and I don't know this, but I would suspect that it is a Schedule C drug, which means that the um, the teratogenicity or the likelihood that the medication will cause birth defects is either um, possible or unknown. So a lot of the medications that are used to treat neuropathic pain, think anticonvulsants, antidepressants, baclofen, most if not all of these are are uh, these uh, these I think class I think it's class C. I, I'd have to look up the exact classification, but basically it's either uh, definite or unknown teratogenic potential. I would suspect that medical marijuana falls under that, but I, I, I don't know. The best thing to do is talk to your prescriber and ask them. Um, it, it, it would probably be most prudent to get off of that stuff um, if you're having uh, a baby, if you're trying to or actually having a baby. The other thing to think about, rather than just the teratogenic effects and you know, the birth defects, is what are the cognitive developmental effects? in the baby, right? And so that's a different consideration that may not be reflected in that classification. Just like having um, a baby while on chronic opioids, right? The child can be born addicted to opioids, right? And so um, it's not a birth defect, it's an, it's an actual addiction. And so, you know, that needs to be considered in somebody who's, who's a childbearing age and considering having children. Doesn't mean that person can't use the medication, but you may want to use it in the context of an overall birth control regimen that prevents an unwanted pregnancy. You know, there, there are ways around it, um, but it's definitely something to consider. And I think uh, a person needs to be careful about that. Time for one or two more questions, Ellen. All right. So um, what about if, or is there research, do you know if there's any research out there using medical marijuana with facial pain, if someone wanted to bring research to their physician? Right. So the medical marijuana has been used for neuropathic pain in general. I'm not aware of dedicated studies for facial pain, at least none that are completed. I mean, Jeff may know may know of no. some. I'm not aware of any. But understand that the history of medical marijuana has really started, at least in Western medicine, dealing with craniofacial pain, the headache pain syndromes. Right. Uh, so, you know, there's a history of it for pain above the neck. So I, I have no reservations recommending all of my facial pain patients who are considering neuromodulation to try medical marijuana. I don't know that you need to bring a paper that shows that medical marijuana is effective in trigeminal neurology to your doctor. Just showing them that there's clinical trial data supporting its use for neuropathic pain in general. And I mean a diverse population of neuropathic pain patients, not one specific type of neuropathic pain. But neuropathic pain in general, uh, I think that's you know sufficiently compelling to at least try the medication. Now it's hard to make population-based judgments. Like one can't say that medical marijuana works great for trigeminal neurology as a population. But when I have a patient who's sitting across from me who's suffering from facial pain, I would absolutely recommend that, that patient talk to their pain physician about getting a medical marijuana prescription. You try it, and if it works, outstanding. And if it doesn't, then you move on to the next therapy. There's very little downside to trying this or most any other medication, in my opinion. On that note, I'm the one with gray hair in this uh, discussion, and I'd like to say that I would never have conceived in 1968, 50 years ago, that we would be sitting talking about the medical advantages of cannabis. But it's quite a remarkable turnaround, and I hope that many patients are able to benefit in the future. And I want to thank you, Christopher, Dr. Winfrey, that was an amazing discussion, and I hope people enjoyed it and learned from it. And all right, I thank you all for paying attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown, and thanks again to the Facial Pain Association, to all the attendees. And again, if there's any doubt, ask your doctor about it. And if they say no, ask them again and just say, look, can I at least try it? If it's legal in your state, I think it's reasonable to try if you're suffering from pain. There's very little downside to it. Thank you. Let's see if we can. All right, thank you everyone for joining the Facial Pain Association's webinar and thank you, Dr. Winfrey. Thank you. Thank you.